Um, I, um, uh, I, I know that I'm painfully visible, um, and also at this point I have to say that because of a retinal problem, I find the lights too bright, and unless they can be dimmed, <laughs> I will have to wear this. Okay. Is that the uh, 92nd Street wide baseball cap? Um, I, I guess so. It, it is the latest version. Um, I, um, uh, I confess when I saw it, um, you know, whenever I see a letter and a number, I uh, immediately think of uh, an element and its atomic number. <laughs> I, I, and of course, I felt it should either be 92U or, or of course, 39Y. Because, well, why being it for him? Uh, however, it is the 92nd Street Y. Um, now, um, Petra, um, uh, we've been enjoying your extraordinary film, and um, I wanted to ask you all sorts of questions. How you met Eric, uh, how the um, idea developed, uh, to what extent it was planned beforehand, and to what extent there was just a process between you which, which generated it. And so tell us about the making of the film. Yeah, there are certainly many, uh, two versions of how we met, because like an old couple, we have two <laughs> points of view about, on it. My point, can I tell it? Sure. <laughs> uh, my, uh, my, um, I, I, I had a phone call in the night of, uh, with a friend who told me, uh, you're all, he talked to me, you always talk about psychoanalysis, but the only man who is bringing this field uh, in advance at the moment, the most interesting person, is Eric Kandel. And I asked, who is it? And he said, you never know nothing, you don't read, what is this, yeah? <laughs> So I went to the kitchen, uh, I have a thing there to write what's lacking, butter, milk, Eric Candle, <laughs> so <laughs> to remember uh, that I make research on him. Uh, and I looked a quick in the internet, I didn't found because I wrote Eric with K, uh, Erich, you know. And then I went the next day to Berlin on a reception with, uh, I was invited uh, with Wim Wenders because I did a film. And there were a lot of Nobel Prize winners in the room. And uh, there was a counselor, everybody was very black and uh, champagne. And there was coming a woman with a book and there was written Eric Kandel. And I said, oh, this is, must be him, yeah? And then I went to the woman uh, to see what the book is and she stood with a man and I was quiet waiting and I looked and the man on the book cover and he was the same. So <laughs> logically I, I thought it must be Eric Kandel. So I approached and said, it's you, because it was such a big coincidence. Yeah? It's you bringing, uh, you are the worldwide best uh, neurologue and bringing the psychoanalysis in Taiwan. And he said, yes, of course I am. And <laughs> <laughs> he started to tell me about aplesia, about dendrites, axons, and I was standing there, never heard anything about science. I have no pre, uh, no, uh, con uh, con pre I don't know, knew nothing about science before. And, but he, he I mean, told you, you, you had made films before, but not about scientists. Never, never. And I, I never uh, read books about science, no special interest in brain mm -hmm. science, excuse mm -hmm. me. But, and, <laughs> and so, but he was telling it so vividly, and you know him now after the film, and with a trust that I understand everything yeah, in these five minutes. So I said, more to myself, it must be wonderful to make a film about this. And so he called Denise, <laughs> she was around. This is Petra, a German filmmaker. We are going to make a film together. <laughs> so it was a sort of, sort of love at first sight. Yeah, and, yeah. it was collaboration at first sight. Right. And, yeah. right. Or love. <laughs> um, uh, uh, how long did the filmmaking take? Uh, it was uh, uh, over, a pro uh, the process went on uh, one and a half year. Uh -huh. And no, with, with everything it was two years. Right. Uh, and a great deal was spontaneous and unpremeditated. It, yeah, we yeah. never... Uh, all yeah. of it. 
There was no script. Uh -huh. There was never a double take on anything. Right. No. Uh, For the, uh, my, my crew uh, went crazy yes. about this, but... Right. Um, and there must have been all sorts of decisions, finally, I guess, at the editing desk. Yeah. As to I had uh, 60 hours of material. 60? 60. 60. 60. Six oh, yes. uh, I have always sixty. Yes. I don't oh, know why yes. it's okay. coming. Right. Right. Um, and and uh, it was ten hours of uh, pure science. Yes. Yeah. All right. Well, I, I hope you will keep the other fifty-nine. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> definitely. All right. Um, uh, by the way, um, w what was the the most difficult? part of the filming or the, what presented the most, um, were there any uh, special obstacles um, yeah. um, um, other than Eric? The, the yeah. <laughs> no, I, I would say if, if not uh, the, the, our relation wouldn't have been so good, the film couldn't have, to, right. um, have yeah. been made because we had obstacle, obstacles, uh, difficulties, uh, the financing was a horrible yeah. to get mm. uh, a small yes. amount of money, yeah. even in Austria and Germany, yeah. it was very difficult. Um, and I, I imagine the sp a special problem was weaving together the personal and the scientific, as as you do so marvelously well, in I your in your book, Eric. And well, it's very kind of you, but I must say, Petra brought a sense of originality to it that I did not contribute to the film. The going back and forth, for example, when Denise is looking for the tunnel, yes. and then. Petra flashes back to my lab, where we had, of course, shot the scene on mice finding the way around in space. So looking for space and coming back and seeing how space is represented in the brain. Really quite brilliant in her part to yeah. do this. And at several points, she goes back and forth in a very imaginative way between my personal life and the science. Mm -hmm. Now, the thing was I wanted to make clear the, the deeper connections between yeah. things. Um. Well, uh, and of course, in, in your book, you are always going yes. to and fro. And, yes. and before this autobiographic book, In Search of Memory, I think all of your, your scientific books have, have um, moved historically. You, you're obviously right. in love with history and have yes, to present, absolutely. have to think I see myself as an intellectual historian. Yeah. My experience, even in high school, I liked history best. Yeah. And Mr. Campana was a history teacher. <laughs> And he saw what potential right. limited talent yeah. that I had in, in history, and that I think got him yeah. interested in. Um, now, um, but at what point did you consider writing a history of yourself, an autobiography? I had never thought of it uh, until I won the Nobel Prize. And then a very peculiar thing happened. Harold Varmus, who is a Nobel laureate, also a very distinguished scientist, head of Sloan Kettering, uh, called me up and he said, uh, Eric, I need to talk to you. You're going to go to Stockholm. Why don't I ride my bicycle up to your office? He rides his bicycle all around the city and come and tell you what you need to do. And I said, Harold, you're ahead of Sloan Kettering. You're not going to ride your bicycle to my office. I'm going to come down and see you. And I came down and he said, Eric, you have to prepare two things for the Nobel Foundation. You have to prepare a lecture, and you've got to take that seriously. But you also have to prepare an autobiographical essay. And that varies a great deal. Some people just submit a CV, a curriculum vitae. Others write a coherent essay. You should write a good autobiographical essay. Get going now. This is October. Start working so by the time you get there, you've got something in hand. And I'd never done anything before. I'd never written an autobiographical essay. And I did it, and when it appeared, my friends, a number of whom are here, read it and said, wow. You know, this is quite interesting. And they gave me the idea that if I took the autobiography and I took the lecture and put it together, I would have the makings of a book. Um, yeah, well, the, the, you know, th this really is two books in one, but, it's, but, but then the, the life and work are inseparable. Um, I, um, uh, I know that when I started writing my book, Uncle Tungsten. At first, I thought I had two books, one of which was a history of chemistry and one was a history of myself, but then they, they yeah. same how. But, but, but of course, there, it was only retrospective, whereas you have lived and created so well, much the... I mean, you've, um, you're so being very modest about yourself. Uh, I actually think 
that both you and I did absolutely the right thing. I was advised, I mentioned it to you on one occasion, to make three books out of mine. A, an editor came to me and said, oh, look, you committed to Norton. Why don't you just give them one third of the book and give me the other two? <laughs> um, the, um, um, did writing an autobiography alter your your perspective or your opinion on yourself? And, 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 di and did it also do anything to alter the nature of your own memories, the sort of um, formalizing them? It, it, um, well, first of all, it forces you to remember things. And since I didn't remember everything for the autobiography, I checked as much as possible. Uh, how large was Colomea, the city in which my mother was born? How large was Olesko where my father was born? So I would call up embassies and get these facts or check with people. There were a number of people that I got to know were known from Coca-Cola. So I, insofar as it's possible, when one gets to be our age, there are not that many other witnesses around. So I had to check with other historical sources. So that alone reinforces your, your memory. Um, and I mean, once you have it down, you sort of repeated it and you worry actually how it may form your memory in a more romantic way than it was. I mean, yeah. that's my worry about the repetition. Does it make it uh, more legendary than real yeah. in your own mind? Um, um, thinking back, um, uh, say when you were 12 or, or 15, were you a sort of um, a scientific nerd, a sort of precocious scientist then or not? Not at all. I mean, you were bent to become a distinguished scientist. Uh, I had no interest in science whatsoever. Um, I was interested early on in journalism. Uh, Myron Kandel, who's no relative but a very distinguished journalist, is here. And he and I were consecutively um, the editor, sports editors of the Dutchman, Rasmus Hall High School. And then I wrote on my own a weekly column in Gotham Sports, modestly entitled, Breaking the Tape with Eric Kandel. <laughs> <laughs> I was hard to believe the captain of the Erasmus, or co-captain of the Erasmus Hall track team. Uh, and I was interested in athletics and I was interested in history. And at Harvard, I was interested in intellectual history and I wrote my dissertation on the failure of the intellectuals in, in Germany the attitude to national socialism of three German writers. Uh, and then I fell in love with this woman, Anna Chris, whose parents were distinguished psychoanalysts. And they essentially said to me, what's a nice Jewish boy like you doing in intellectual history? You should be doing psychoanalysis. That's where the future is. And that's what got me interested in psychoanalysis. And that's when I took my first, I had finished three years of college, three out of four years, not taking a single science course except Mm -hmm. a natural science course, which is an obligatory course, sort of, you know, science for the poets. Um, uh, and then you must have made this, this very radical, audacious jump, wondering, though of course Freud himself wondered, what about the biology of mind? This is, what is going this on? This is really true, and this is where Denise comes in. Um, I took this elective with Harry Grunfest, and I found to my astonishment, and this is what I tell young people, working in the lab is so completely different than reading textbooks. And I really liked this stuff. It was like, you know, Talmudic arguments about what should be the experiments and how do we think about them. And a lot of sort of interesting social gossip about who was sleeping with whom and things like this. Quite wonderful to spend a day when you're doing an experiment, particularly when you're working on a cat, it usually takes two people and they usually bond together and they share interesting stories. I like this a great deal. I remember having din dinner with Denise one night and telling her how much I like this and that I was, you know, I'd love to do this for the rest of my life to make this as a career, but it's ridiculous. You have no money and I have no money. You know, I have to go into clinical practice. And she said, absurd. Money is of no significance whatsoever to me. She's never repeated those magic words since then, but, that, <laughs> <laughs> but she was absolutely, and she strongly convinced me. She had come from a more research. She was getting a PhD with Merton, the great sociologist. She was much more interested in science than I was. And she encouraged me all the time. In fact, I really, my, my idea is that I spent all of my life living up to the expect, unrealistic expectations she has of me. <laughs> 
Um, at the equivalent stage of my own life, when I was at Oxford, I did my degree in what they called PPP, which was psychology, philosophy, and physiology. However, there seemed an infinite gap, an abyss between the physiology at that time, which mostly had to do with the spinal cord and That's reflexes, right. and psychology. Um, now, however, you decided to look at the physiology of mind and to go back to a very primitive animal, similar to the slug, which Absolutely. I have on my tie. I, I felt very honored when I saw that <laughs> tie, which you had shown me on an um, occasion. Um, um, and, uh, and to look at single cells. Yep, yep, yep. So the single cells I learned from Greg first, when I told him ego id and super ego, he said, boy, boy, chick, this is not the way to approach the brain. You have to study it one cell at a time. And when I came to the NIH, so I learned how to do recordings from simple animals, uh, crayfish in Harry Grenfell's lab. When I came to the NIH, I had a wonderful boss, but he had a very interesting history. He had done some of the most important work in the late 1930s. He discovered how the body surface was represented in the brain. There was a topographical representation for touch. He then did this for hearing, and he then did this for vision. Wade Marshall, Nobel Prize work. Um, one day, he walked into a collaborator's, actually his boss's office, Philip Bard, with a gun in his hand and threatened to kill him because he thought Bard was taking too much credit for their joint work. He had a psychotic episode. He was hospitalized and came out after several years and uh, never regained the energy to carry out new experiments, so he did rather routine things, but he gave enormous freedom to the young people that worked with him, and he had a prominent position after he got out of the hospital at the NIH. In fact, there's a side story, a humorous story. I once asked, wait, uh, I once asked Seymour Ketty, who was head of the institute, how did you think of selecting Wade Marshall uh, mm. to run the most important neurophysiology laboratory in the country? And he said, if we don't employ the mentally ill, the National Institute of Mental Health, yeah. who will? Yeah. Yeah. But in all fairness, Wade Marshall, even though he'd lost his scientific yeah. energy, had a moral stamina and gave yeah. one a sense of integrity in science that was yeah. wonderful. Anyway, Brenda Milner had just published her famous case on HM, yeah. and I thought memory was a central problem for psychoanalysis. And I thought maybe by putting electrodes into single cells in the hippocampus, mm. I would study, understand memory, and that's how I get going. And when, when did you descend from the, the mammalian hippocampus what, when I, to, the, to the sea slug? When I realized how complicated the hippocampus mm. was, and that to understand how information comes in, how it's transformed by learning, uh, would take a very long time. I thought I would take mm. a reductionist approach. Mm. And again, I didn't, the amazing thing is, and this is why I tell people, that science is very different than you think. It's not a question of 20 years of preparation, then you do some science. You learn all the time as you go along, just as you have evolved from one interest in another. This is exactly the way it goes in, in the lab. I went to seminars, and I heard about flies, and I heard about worms. I actually looked into C. elegans. Uh, and so I looked into a number of different systems, and since my strength was recording from single cells, I looked for an animal that had the largest nerve cells, mm -hmm. and that was the snail, mm -hmm. the plesia. Uh, it's, uh, it, it's very impressive how much, how much memory a, uh, an aplysia can have. It, it, it's uh, amazing. I should say, which I didn't make a point in, 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 the, in the movie with, with Petra, is one of the first things I learned about aplysia is how much learning simple animals have. Mm -hmm. Ethologists had pointed just had never dawned on me in quite this powerful yes. way. Yeah. Um, something which is fabulous in the film, uh, the, the, the time-lapse pictures of the, uh, of the neurons groping for each yes. other and, um, and, and the proliferation of the dendrites. Um, I mean, you, you really almost have a feeling of intentionality when you, yeah. when you see them yeah. speed yeah. it up like yeah. that. Yeah. Um, Harshad and Joe, the two people who were in that movie are here, um, they're really spectacular. Yes. That um, to do that dissection that Petra captured mm -hmm. with other people watching is very mm -hmm. difficult. I thought it was one of the most beautiful parts of the movie when you see mm -hmm. these cells popping out. Um, uh, yeah. um, one wonders whether, uh, where memory starts. I seem to have 
read that certain protozoa, slime fungi, can learn. Even bacteria have certain simple yes. forms, certain protozoa yes. have. So it's built into the single cell organism. Yeah. And uh, one, one wonders about plants as well. Because they absolutely. Can, well, in right. order to survive, you have to distinguish between what is dangerous and what is safe. So there is this capability for modification of behavior that must be built into any organism that yeah, survives yeah, in an yeah. open environment. Um, now, hippocampus. Um, you, um, you speak in the film of how if there's massive damage to the hippocampal systems, m memory, which you call the glue, disappears, and the mind may become fragmented. There's a lack of continuity, and I think you, in the film, you speak of a lack of who, of identity. Um, but um, I have seen many people with, with amnesia over the years, and they, um, uh, although there is something profoundly amiss, they don't seem to me to be lacking in identity. And you yourself remark of, of, of H.M. that he was a man of charm, that he had a sense of humor. And um, so many things, including some forms of memory, uh, can be spared or preserved uh, even in the face uh, of a uh, profound ab amnesia. Absolutely. So I, I discuss at length in the book, yeah. because this is what I study in snails, I did not emphasize in the movie mm. that what H.M. shows, that is having a defect in the hippocampus, a severe deficit in a certain class of memory that we now call explicit. But the remarkable thing about patients with complete loss of this kind of memory, memory for people, places, and objects, is they can still remember motor and perceptual skills. And many things that we learn, even fairly creative things like playing a musical instrument or painting, once it's mastered, by paying yes. attention to it, it becomes almost reflexive. Yeah. Well, well, I certainly saw this. I, I wrote about us, you know, in, in, in Clive, this Fantastic. English musician. Maybe you would describe a little bit. Um, 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 Clive was a, um, a musicologist, musician of great eminence in England, who in 1984 had an encephalitis which wiped out his memory systems. I mean, he is supposedly has the severest amnesia ever described. A recent film was called The Man with a Seven Second Memory. But Clive, who only has a, a few seconds, and the moment his attention moves, he's lost it, but he's able to conduct an orchestra, to conduct a chorus, to play at the piano, to improvise, he is totally, in, uh, and at the highest professional level, he's totally and wonderfully intact in this way and creatively intact. Although within seconds of conducting, he's, you know, he's, um, he no longer remembers having done yeah. it. I also know a very eminent actor whose name I can't reveal, but you will learn of it sooner or later, uh, with a somewhat similar problem, but his consummate acting skills and his enormous repertoire from, you know, from Marlowe to, to, ben, uh, uh, to Beckett is, is completely intact. And um, so, so some sort of identity, I think, can uh, be there, but, but, but it's entirely in the present. The, 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 as you say, there's no time travel anymore to past or future. Right, right. It's remarkable. Let, let's elaborate on this uh, just a little bit more. Uh, what is so fantastic, is, as Oliver indicated, is with Clive Waring, he will play the piano quite brilliantly. These are obviously things he's familiar with. And as soon as he starts playing, if you ask him, how do you feel when you play the piano? He says, what are you talking about? I haven't played the piano since I got ill. I mean, it's amazing. He just played a few minutes before. Uh, and what I find interesting about that is that de Kooning, for example, when he had advanced Alzheimer's disease, could still paint paintings that got several million dollars in the open market. This was not the height of his creativity, but still a high level of creativity. Yeah. So even what we consider yeah. enormously creative acts after a while in the hands yeah. of masters yeah. become almost unconscious activity. Yeah. And this is not the main part of what Freud talked about, but Freud emphasized how much of mental life was unconscious. Mm. And I think H.M. and Clive and people like that show that this is really true. Mm. Much yes. of our life is led unconsciously. 
Uh, and not only amnesic people like H. M. and Clive, but as you remarked of de Kunig, but of, of people with dementia, with Alzheimer's Absolutely. disease. I mean, a colleague of mine actually wrote a book about Alzheimer's called The Loss of Self. I, I, I objected profoundly to the title because I think you absolutely see the preservation of self in all sorts of ways, certainly in, in action, in skill, in sensibility, in behavior, right, right, even, even if right, there's no explicit right. memory. I think the difference is the definition of self. The person no longer sees himself as a unity. Clive says, you know, it's like a continuous dream, a sleep without any dreams. Mm. One from the outside sees a certain coherence of the personality, but the person himself doesn't sense that coherence. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, now, memory, your memories, and in particular, what, what in a way is the center of the book and the film at the starting point, or seems to be the starting point, this, um, these terrifying memories of the, the knock on the door, the, the brutal entry, the sudden smashing of your life when you were eight years old. Um, the, um, do you relate your own life work, your, your trajectory to, to this? Do you think you, memory would have been your subject anyhow? You know, I, as, as I say in the movies, it's impossible to know why one does something later, yeah. to what degree specific events in one's earlier life. But to me, this neurotic obsession with Vienna and what happened there. It's like a post-traumatic stress experience. I'm mm -hmm. trying to, by right. working it through time and time again, you know, we collect this. So you walk into a house, yes. you think it's a European house. I mean, it's, it's ridiculous in yeah. some ways. Denise and I, it, it, Denise has a similar thing. The amount of time she has spent trying to reconstitute yeah. where her father was in hiding, what her mother was doing. Um, um, yeah. Well, I was, I was very much reminded here, and, and I think we need to get onto this, of, 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 what psychoana of, of what psychoanalysis does or attempts to do, which is to some extent to represent one's past and one's memories, including unconscious and traumatic and neurotic memories, especially for reconsideration and... Um, uh, and, and perhaps re retranscription in a uh, in a more understanding form, I th I think that's more spaciously. It, it, in fact, one of the things I really find interesting about this situation is I think one of the reasons the three of us communicate very well with each other on a number of levels is that we've all been analyzed. I mean, Petra has been in analysis, and I must say the sense of integrity that emerged in our relationship is we're both very comfortable, not only with each other's conscious behavior, mm -hmm. but with this, oh, oh, my sort of unconscious, <laughs> hypomanic state periodically. She's quite, and you what? You're shouting at me. Well, yeah. I'm accustomed, I have women shouting at me all the time. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, now, to connect um, uh, psychoanalysis with, with the snail, or at least with, with biology, as Freud always hope to do. Yes. Um, uh, well, um, you know, um, Freud has taken uh, a bashing in the last half century or so, um, and obviously some things have to be thrown out. Um, but um, other things one feels may be very precious, uh, but one would need more than individual stories. One would need sort of outcome studies, brain imaging, and so forth. And so what are your thoughts about the validation and the future I, I of think psychoanalysis? You're exactly right. Uh, I think psychoanalysis gave us and continues to give us the richest, most nuanced view of mental life that we have. Uh, that we're in an early stage of understanding the human mind is obvious. Uh, that Freud got many things right in outline, but was wrong on a number of things. He had no insight into female sexuality at all. Uh, I mean, if you read people like Schnitzler, now granted, he slept with like 450,000 women. <laughs> <laughs> so he obviously knew more about female sexuality than yes. who Freud did. A Klimt similarly had much deeper insights into women. Um, 
so Freud didn't understand certain things very well. But he, he, he didn't understand music, and he said that. Didn't understand music. Um, um, although, he didn't understand. Mo I'm sorry. Although interestingly, he said it's partly because music moved him so profoundly, yet so inexplicably, that he. That that's never that's really it. interesting. Yes. Because he couldn't control it. Yeah. He also didn't have any insight into modern art. You know, he was a collector. He collected antiquities, and he wrote about Renaissance painters. He wrote about Michelangelo, Leonardo da Vinci, two famous essays. But Klimt, Schilling, Kokoschka, he thought they were just garbage. He just didn't understand mm -hmm. modern art at all. Uh, so I think the problem is not with Freud. Freud was a great man, and there's all great men. He had strengths and weaknesses. I mean, even the three of us have an occasional weakness. I most of all, but probably even the two of you have some weaknesses. That's not surprising. You know, our heroes, Sherrington, Hodgkin, Huxley, I mean, all people who do science for a while, there are certain things, particularly interpretive things, where the facts are unclear, which they're likely to be wrong. The problem with psychoanalysis is that um, there has been no follow-up generation that brought the curiosity, the sense of trying to do, make a science out of it. And unless people come along and begin to do biology in relationship mm. uh, to psychoanalysis, it's gonna go down the tubes, mm. which would be a tragedy. Mm. Because the chances are, the quality of psychoanalysis that is now practiced in the best hands is probably better than it ever was. Mm. Uh, but with the exception of Aaron Beck, the yeah, reason I admire him so much, he was the first one to do outcome studies. He mm. showed that his therapy works better than selective serotonin uptake inhibitors mm -hmm. for mild and moderate depression. Fantastic uh, contribution. Um, uh, may work as well or better, but may also work ultim ultimately like that by altering the brain. Oh, and also, uh, also altering it in a subtler and more permanent way. Absolutely right. Uh, if I may be self-propagandizing for a minute, one of the essays I enjoy most in my, in my writings about psychoanalysis, and I am a pontificator about psychoanalysis, I really don't work in it. Many years ago, um, I wrote an essay called Psychotherapy and the Single Synapse. Mm -hmm. This was based as a spoof on a book on sex and the single girl, which mm -hmm. appeared at that point. Uh, and I pointed out that insofar as psychotherapy works, it presumably must produce anatomical changes in the brain because these changes persist. Mm -hmm. And it was like long-term memory, and of course this is what's emerging. People have now done imaging studies, including people influenced by Aaron Beck. They've shown, for example, in obsessive compulsive neurosis, there's a hyperactivity of an area of the brain called the striatum, which is involved in repetitive activity. And insofar patients respond in psychotherapy successfully, that abnormality disappears. In depression, area 25 is abnormally active. When that depression lifts, the abnormality mm -hmm. disappears. So there's the beginning of being able to use imaging techniques or other independent methods to diagnose the illness and then see whether the therapy works. And it need not work like pharmacotherapy. Mm -hmm. Presumably, you can get a therapeutic outcome in a number of different ways, and you pointed out that in certain ways, psychotherapy may be better than drugs. Kay Jamison, you must know her. Mm -hmm. Do you know the woman who wrote this fantastic thing, Unquiet Mind, Kay no, Jamison? Oh, indeed, I know fabulous, her well. Fabulous, fabulous yes. person. She has a fantastic section in her book in which she describes um, her manic depressive illness. And she said, if it wasn't for lithium, I would have killed myself. But if it wasn't for, I'm sorry, if it wasn't for psychotherapy, my life would be meaningless. Mm. It allowed me to make coherence out of all yeah. my... Um, um, interestingly, uh, there's another book by a namesake, though no relative of mine, called Elaine Sachs. Um, oh, she's fantastic. Um, and this is a, uh, a woman who was regarded as deeply schizophrenic with a hopeless prognosis when she was 20 or so. She is now uh, a professor, professor of law, uh, of law and psychiatry at USC and a brilliant and creative brilliant. writer, but she lays equal stress for herself on medication, psychoanalysis, and social support. The, 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 yeah. she, I, I met her once. I didn't realize she's your relative. That's, she's a spectacular person, as yes. are you. Uh, um, she was very fortunate. I think she comes from a very affluent family because mm -hmm. she was able to you know, have full time. She's been in analysis since then. She's had to, she always had the very best yes, medical right. care. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah. um, 
Now, I'm going to have to wind up soon. Um, I think I'm going to want to ask you one um, personal question, although it's a question one could ask any of you. Um, are you satisfied with your own memory? Does it serve your purposes sufficiently? In general, are people's memories adequate to their needs? And, um, uh, and um, what do you think of so-called memory enhancement? And also, what do you think of, of the need to forget? Now, in fact, you only have two minutes, and I don't know how... My <laughs> God! I knew you were a demanding questioner. <laughs> Uh, my memory is flawed. Petra's memory is much better than mine. She's always reminding me of things. Uh, and I, um, at one time, got interested in memorists, like the patient yes, at Luria indeed, study. Indeed, indeed, People yeah. that remember absolutely everything. And there are Talmudists who can remember every word of every single page of the Babylonian Talmud. And I was delighted to learn that these people are miserable. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Bjorg, Bjorg has this wonderful story about uh, the memorist, and the guy says, I remember everything, my head is filled with garbage. I, I just, you know, I can't really think creatively about it. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think forgetting things, you know, getting rid mm -hmm. of some of those mm -hmm. connections uh, so that you can grow additional things is probably yes. important. Um, uh, uh, and also forgetting so that you can rediscover. This uh, seems such this a crucial part of creativity. Yes, yes. Um, yes. Yeah. Now, um, I think um, for both of you, because I think we have to end up now, um, what do you think the, the film is going to accomplish? And, um, uh, and for both of you. Petra, you should begin. Um, no, I... Excuse what did me. you hope the <laughs> film would accomplish? <laughs> for me, for me, in the process of doing the film, it was the question how, how um, memory, how you uh, um, uh, show it in the film, how is the image of uh, uh, memory, for example. We discussed a lot how how one uh, sees the things. Is memory something abstract, or do you see images? Do you see colors or not? You remember we discussed this, and and for me this was an issue to to yeah to f to search this in my film. Yeah, how to demonstrate uh, visually uh, this, and yeah, and I hope uh, that the the passion which all the, the people in the lab and Eric has for science is something, it's a spark which goes to other people who see the film. And I think it's also a film about the, the Jewish issue. Oh, oh yeah, many, many things. During um, we shoot it, uh, I, I talked to a friend, a director, Jewish, who the whole family uh, was um, uh, killed in, in Auschwitz, and he also was in Auschwitz. And I was all passionate about memory, memory. Mm. And then he sat quiet, mm. and he ol only mm. asked me, who helps me to forget? And this mm. for me was... Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. It's um, another... Yes. Um, uh, well, well, the films affect people differently from books, and certainly yeah. you know, one hopes the film will be very widely seen. Um, and um, Eric, what are your final well, thoughts? Two, I had a personal reason. My grandchildren <laughs> are here, two of my grandchildren, and the idea that they may look at this movie and see themselves and see their grandparents 40 years from now and that maybe their children would see this movie was an enormous sort of mm. comfort to me. Um, the other thing is I think many people have a misconception of what science is about. Mm -hmm. Uh, first of all, they think there's sort of a wise man who sits there, runs a the laboratory, and all the ideas are his, and then the people run around and do what he says, and this is just nonsense. Mm -hmm. Most of the ideas I've had, I've developed together with colleagues. Stefan's discovery came from him. You know, we talk generally about growth factors, but anybody mm -hmm. can throw out these general things. To actually make the discovery is the hard work. Yes. So to give a sense of the reality of a yes. lab. Uh, I, I think the feeling of community in your of colleagues and of yes. science how people enjoy it. Very, and very strong. It, you know, mm -hmm. somebody wrote me a letter recently saying he's writing a book about science and he wants to make clear that there are very few 
activities that you do with your clothes on that are just pleasurable <laughs> signs. And I, I wanted to get this idea across that it's a fantastically enjoyable uh, vocation. You're constantly you know, thinking about new things. It also allows you to see scientists in other countries. What it opens up for you is really quite remarkable. So I feel myself to have had a very privileged career. And I told this to my granddaughter at dinner tonight. She got irritated with me because she thinks I'm pulling her leg. But I say, if I can have this kind of thing, you can, because mm -hmm. these kids are every bit as smart mm -hmm. as, as we are. Mm -hmm. And there's no reason they can't have a wonderful mm -hmm. scientific career. Um, I think at this point it would be good to open up the discussion to all of you. And um, so the next um, half an hour or whatever is yours. And uh, thank you both very much. Thank you. Thank you all. We have time for just a few of the audience questions this evening. I'll start with one to, to all of you, which is, what have you learned from seeing this process or working on this process about how better to communicate science to a wider population? What have you learned from this project? About, uh, me? Yeah, why uh, don't you begin, Petra? Uh, uh, I think the most important uh, thing ever in everything you do is uh, to enclose your emo uh, to in enclose, also einbeziehen. To surround. Inclo um, what? A surround, to include. No, no, uh, include your include own group. emotions. And <clears throat> I've saw uh, many people react on this film, scientists, and say, oh, wow, we, can you train us, uh, us how to, to make films uh, about science? And it's funny because I'm not in science, and I made a film which a lot of scientists say it's, it's important. Uh, and the only thing is uh, I included myself in this work and my um, neugier, uh, curiosity. My, my curiosity to find, to see what, how it functions, how they work, and to see also include their feelings in, in this, the way I show it, their work. So I think to include the emotion, emotion is important. It, it's actually interesting. Uh, Oliver, who's not in the movies, um, communicates more brilliantly than the two of us about fundamental scientific ideas. And he does it in a way that is implicit in what we're saying. He takes individuals and describes their life. And he shows you, and this actually emerged in the discussion, that even if you have severe brain damage, that destroys, eliminates certain important mental functions. What remains itself, first of all, allows a certain coherence of personality to persist, and also often exposes richness of mental life that was not apparent when the other functions were intact. This brings the reader into the person's life story and into their mind in a very, very interesting way. And I think what we've tried to do, and I think what science communication has to do, is to show you the human aspect of science, either in terms of the social interaction or what a person gets out of doing science. Uh, I think there are two issues. One is, it's hard to think of a more important educational problem in the United States today than to expose people to science at the highest level of fascination, because young people don't have the culture to understand science when they're mature, they're living in a world that is technologically demanding in which they make decisions based upon information they don't completely understand. And I think we need to, as a society, and scientists need to provide leadership, try a variety of ways to reach out so to communicate scientific knowledge on all levels, from little kids starting out to mature people like ourselves who are not scientists. Uh, so I think there's no single way to do this, but I certainly think what Petra did was, was quite good. And when I listened to the science that we did together, um, 
you know, I don't think it's ideal, but I think the one or two key ideas that we wanted to get across, that mental functions come from the brain, that we change each other's brains when we influence each other's behavior, I think those ideas are spelled out at several levels, and I like to think that they came across. We had a lot of questions, uh, we had a lot of questions in the audience from um, budding scientists and budding filmmakers. I, I wonder if you could all comment on what lessons you would give to the young filmmaker or the young scientist starting today? Um, what lesson would you give, what suggestions would you give a filmmaker starting today? To speak about themselves, to, to make films about what they experience and not to, to have too much concept and more to see what really is going on at the moment and to risk more the, uh, to be in the moment, in the presence and to yeah, include yourself and your, your own, pra pr to look at yourself meanwhile you do something and to include this, your feelings which come and not to be too, to have too much, uh, yeah, to, to lock yourself in concepts or what the other expect from you, the, the, the money givers, yeah? <laughs> what they, uh, yeah, they are very, no? It's a danger. I mean, my, my advice, well, this is a different thing, one is your know, creative act of making a film, um, is two, or three really, to surround yourself with good people. I mean, I think that's an extremely important uh, criterion for a successful scientific life, uh, number one. Number two, to select a problem that has longevity to it. Uh, there are lots of problems that you can solve in six months. Those are not the problems you want to start in on. You want to start in a problem that can carry you for the rest of your career. And often problems at the boundaries, you know, between, uh, let's say, I'm giving you an extreme example. Neurobiology and art, neurobiology and economics. These are problems that are beginning to emerge. Or, you know, the biology of schizophrenia, biology of depression. In the lifetime of a young scientist, those problems are gonna move brilliantly. We know practically nothing about the underlying biology of schizophrenia. Fantastic problem to work on. So I think having a problem that has a deep trajectory. The other thing is to focus. It's very easy for people to, you know, particularly once they get a lab, they have, they have three people, each one is doing something dramatically different. I think it's much more satisfying to work on different aspects of the same problem. Then small contributions fit in and make the whole thing much, much richer. So I think a major problem, but one to which you really commit yourself and focus in over time, is one very good set of criteria for a, a good scientific career. I would add to, to trust in the, uh, the things you begin to see. Yeah, uh, to trust your unconscious. Uh, yeah. I mean, sometimes this is really yeah. important to, to go on, even yeah. if you have a lot of, and, and oh, I oh, yeah, yeah, to go career. on, I mean, yeah, Denise is very good at this. You just don't quit <laughs> when things get tough. Yeah. Um, um, and I think we'll finish this evening with a question that was asked in three different ways, which is, would you really recommend fish and yogurt to feed the brain? I would, I, I, would, you, would you really recommend fish and yogurt to feed the brain? Not simultaneously, but yogurt for lunch and fish for dinner, absolutely. <laughs> but, <laughs> um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, one piece of administration. Thank you so much. <laughs>